beer before the talk. Maybe we should save it for after, because everybody just sits out in the nice weather and drinks their beer. Um, but uh, welcome uh, again. Again, a couple of announcements before I introduce uh, tonight's speaker. We Our next talk and the last one of the season is roughly a month from now, April 19. Um, and I've forgotten the guy's name, but he is he was one of the uh, high seas uh, participants. So he was a participant in the analog the Martian analog in, uh, I guess it's New Mexico, um, where they get isolated for a month and they get a time delay in their communication. So, so he's now working at the Johnson Space Center, but he's going to be here in April 19 uh, for our last talk of the season. And then we'll be planning for next year. So I'm happy if you want to email me any recommendations. Um, I'm just so as you know, I'm free to ignore them. But uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to hear, even if it's just topics, not necessarily people, but topics and or people. Um, the other thing is, you may have seen a bunch of our friends are going to be on TV March 26. Uh, National Geographic is doing a show called, uh, I think it's One Strange Rock. People like Mae Jemison, Mike Massimino, Chris Hadfield, who I believe we'll see tonight uh, on screen. Um, and uh, uh, Bernard Harris, who else is on that one? Anyway, it's all about looking at the Earth from people who've been in space and looked at it from space. So it looks really interesting. Um, One Strange Rock, uh, March 26. So I'm advertising a TV show, but there's some good people on it. Okay, so um, tonight, um, one of the things we were trying to do this season is kind of look a little bit more depth as to what it takes to actually live in space rather than just how cool space is. Um, and some of the things that need to be done to keep people alive in space and so on require some really cool things and some really cool people. Which brings us to tonight's speaker. Um, so Grace Douglas, Dr. Grace Douglas, is the lead scientist for NASA's advanced food technology research effort. And this focuses on uh, determining the methods and technologies and requirements <coughs> to develop a safe and nutritious and palatable food system um, that the astronauts A will want to eat, and more importantly will keep them alive for however long they have to be in space. Uh, Grace's responsibilities including assessing the risk of an inadequate food system, what happens if, if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, um, and how that feeds into um, vehicle design and mission concept and as you build up that whole strategy for whether you're going to the moon or Mars, or I presume even the space station, you know, whatever you're doing. Grace got a uh, Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Food Science from Pennsylvania State University and North Carolina State University, respectively, and has a PhD in Functional Genomics, Genomics, from uh, North Carolina State. So please uh, join me in welcoming tonight's speaker. Thank you all for coming tonight, especially for coming in from that lovely weather. Um, so hopefully I'll make this interesting for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of developing a food system for long duration missions, as well as uh, some of the solutions that we're looking at let me go lift this a little higher. Is that better? Can everybody hear me better? Okay. So, uh, as well as some of the solutions that we're looking at and um, the research that we're doing to try and make sure that we have the right system as we as our exploration missions get longer, as we go on to Mars and deep space. So, the ultimate goal of a space food system encompasses basically five things. We need it to be nutritious. We need it to be acceptable, so the crew want to eat it. This is actually incredibly important. Um, and we need it to be safe and ultimately to promote, promote the crew health and performance, not just uh, sustain it. So we want it to actually do something beyond so that they're performing at their highest level possible. Uh, and con in contrast to these things, we need it to be low resource use. So that doesn't really go with providing the most nutritious system. So in general, we need to figure out what the balance is to provide those things and also to meet the low resource needs for space flight. So we've had a lot of challenges over the years and these are the challenges that we've been working on for basically every food system to date, all the way back to Mercury. Um, the very first challenge is that this is a closed system. So as our missions get longer, this becomes a bigger challenge. Food is not routinely introduced. So new foods are not routinely introduced and they all need to have a multi-year shelf stability. So you can see that in a closed system, this you know might get to the point where your crew starts getting tired of some of these foods over time. We don't have cold storage on most of these missions. Um, we don't have it on the International Space Station for food, so all the food shelf stable. They can't cook in, in space flight. It's all heat or add water. 
Um, there, we can't really provide anything that has a lot of crumbs or free liquid because that can be a problem in microgravity. It can get into the equipment or the crew's eyes. Um, so we can't really transfer food in space flight. Everything is individually packaged, which is a resource problem because then you have a lot of packaging in space flight. And there's not a lot of time for the crew, especially on missions like the International Space Station missions where they're working a lot on uh, science experiments. There's not a lot of time for them to prepare food. So really, they need to be able to prepare and eat their foods within 30 minutes as a crew. They can't wash or reuse containers. There's not a lot of water. And they actually only have about two and a half liters per crew per day for food and, and drinking purposes. So historically, this problem was solved on Mercury by providing tubes and cubes. So they would just squeeze the tubes into their mouth and the first thing to be eaten in space flight was applesauce out of a tube by John Glenn. Um, and then they had tubes, uh, cubes that were coated in gelatin so they wouldn't have crumbs and they would just pop them into their mouth. That wasn't a very acceptable system, but it did prove that the crew could eat in space flight and that they didn't have any issues with swallowing. So for the Gemini missions, they added rehydratable foods, so freeze-dried foods that they could add water to, and they had a little water gun to add that water. But they were still just cutting open the packages and squeezing it right into their mouth. So you're missing a lot of the sensations that you get from eating foods by doing that. So this was not a very acceptable system. And some of these missions were actually getting a little longer, up to two weeks. And a lot of this food was coming back. Crews were losing quite a bit of weight, which is a problem in space flight. So on the Apollo missions, they did a couple of different things. They added canned food for the first time, and they added utensils. So they were um, able to eat. If the food had the right viscosity, then the surface tension would keep the food in the package or on the utensil while they were eating. So they started eating with utensils, and they had hot water for the first time which they actually said was incredibly important, especially when they started going on their um, on moonwalks, so on their extravehicular activities. They said they often would get very cold, and to have that hot water when they came in was incredibly important. So that's actually something even now, um, with some of the new exploration missions, the shorter ones, you know, we still uh, try to make sure we're gonna have that hot water for them, especially on missions that are longer than two or three days. So Skylab was actually the best food system we've had to date, and that was because that was the only time we had refrigerators and freezers in space flight. And the food was still processed because we do not want to have an incidence of foodborne illness in microgravity and also where there's not a lot of medical capability. So processed food, refrigerated, frozen, um, they, they liked the system, but they did say it took longer to heat the food up to prepare the food because it was frozen. And so because they were also very busy, they didn't like that aspect of it. Um, but more food was eaten on these missions. So when we went to shuttle, we had a resource issue again. So we lost the refrigerators and freezers, and we actually had to package all of our food in lightweight, flexible packaging because um, the cans and any rigid packaging, it produced too much trash because we started having larger crews, seven crews, sometimes even larger than that, for up to two weeks. And um, the up mass and then the trash on the other side was just too high. So everything became flexible. So no more cans. We moved to um, a flexible package like the Meals Ready to Eat that the military uses. And um, this system was about, we had about 130 different items and it was the first system to also be used on the International Space Station. So the International Space Station missions now are getting longer. It's still all rehydrate. Um, your foods with water and then heat them. That's all the capability they had. So on the International Space Station, they have hot water and ambient water, and they have the capability to um, heat their foods by conduction. That was the old suitcase food warmer. They actually just got a little oven area that also heats by conduction, but they can put a lot more foods in it. And basically, the shuttle system did not provide enough variety. Um, so there were two issues with it. Was One was that there wasn't enough variety, and two was that Unlike shuttle, where the food launched with the crew, now the food um, was getting sent on resupply missions. So if the crew picked a preference menu, they might not get their food. And actually, somebody else might get it. And so, you know, you think, okay, well, their crew, they're just going to eat what's there. They'll do what they have to do. Well, you do find out that if they don't like the food, they don't eat as much of it. And this can lead to weight loss, which is a huge problem in space flight. So the average weight loss for these missions was about 5%, and this was early ISS. And we had some crew members that lost 10% of their body mass. And some of that was because they were getting food that they didn't select, that somebody else selected. So 
In order to work with the resupply delays and also to provide more variety, we did increase um, our variety to about 200 items on the standard menu. So we did quite a bit of product development and we switched to a standard menu. So this is what is used today. Uh, we send the foods up in categories. So it's basically pantry style. So the categories listed here, there's eight of them. They get one of each of those categories to open and, and it's basically a big um, bag full of these food packages like you see in the middle. And these foods are all canned food and pouches basically, rehydratable foods, uh, things like nuts and crackers, um, beverages that are all powdered and they add water. And they get some, um, some of these containers that are crew specific. Uh, so they go through uh, a set of these about every seven days. So there's actually a lot of variety in these and it can work if your crew members all want something different. But if you really like something, like if you really like beef steak, it might only be in that whole set of containers. There might be two, maybe three packages. So you have three people eating out of that. So if you all really like beef steak and you all select it the very first day they're open, you don't get it again for the next six days. And so you can put some things you really like in your crew specific containers. We try to encourage them to pick shelf stable things from the grocery store that have up to a two year shelf life. We need at least a two-year shelf life to be able to send it on the International Space Station um, so that they can increase the variety that they have. And we did find when we moved to the system, crew were eating more. And if they were eating enough and using the advanced resistive exercise device, Dr. Scott Smith, the nutritional biochemist, determined that there were some crew members that were coming back with, uh, their, with their full body mass and with their intact bone density. And so this is really important when you start looking at exploration missions that we can do this. If we provide the right food and they're eating it and they're exercising correctly, they can maintain bone density. Um, so there's actually quite a few things that we're learning on the International Space Station. That was just one of them. So we do still see some body mass loss, but it can be maintained. Uh, we also see some other things. So they still have some incidents of gastrointestinal distress, not necessarily related to the food system. Some of it is space adaptation sickness. Um, Actually, we've never had a case related to the food system. So uh, they also see some increased uh, stress, anxiety, and depression symptoms. There's never been a clinical case in spaceflight. There has, is some, um, some research that suggests that there might be a change in virulence in some microorganisms. And then there's quite a bit of research that suggests that the immune system is dysregulated in spaceflight. So there's some changes that happen with the crew physiology. And this includes that their microbiome shifts in space flight um, and that some of their nutritional requirement shifts. So we're learning all of these things and we want to be able to support the crew so that they can maintain their health on these long duration missions. Um, so one of the things we really want to do is to be able to provide non-invasive countermeasures for these because as we get on longer duration missions and we get further from Earth, our medical capability is going to decrease. So we want to be able to provide something that we have to take anyway. And of course, the biggest thing that we can provide is food. So historically, uh, food has been a support system, but now we're getting into food as potentially a countermeasure. So food affects every aspect of physiology. What we eat, our microbiome is going to eat. And our microbiome is actually going to process that. And if we're eating the right foods, it produces metabolites that interact in, with our immune system <coughs> in ways that actually promote our immunity. And those metabolites can also interact with the gut-brain access, access and, um, and provide benefits to us psychologically if we're eating the right things. And so uh, the food system is greatly modifiable and there are things that we can do now. So if we do these studies here on Earth and we work to try and build the right food system, so targeted uh, nutritional plans for our crew members, we can actually use this as a countermeasure that we're already going to take anyway to some of these physiological changes and possibly performance decrements. So we have to look at where we're going now too, because we know we, we're on six month microgravity missions. We're moving to two and a half year, two and a half year missions. So we're moving away from where our radiation impacts are known and we're gonna have an unknown radiation impact. Um, and we're moving away from regularly scheduled resupply. So actually the situation we're in where we have limited variety it's going to go down again when we go on these long duration missions. And the food is actually most likely going to be pre-positioned ahead of the crew. So it might be pre-positioned before crew selected. So we won't have resupply and we probably won't have crew preference. So they're gonna have to eat what is there. 
Um, also, we, we don't have refrigerators and freezers right now. Uh, we might have them in the future, so we're doing some work to see what refrigeration systems can buy us in terms of years of shelf life, and it might end up being something that we really need to go on these long duration missions. So I want to point out that there's actually no precedent for a five year shelf life. If you look historically at exploration, human exploration, um, missing even one nutrient would kill you. And this happened quite a bit. And during the age of sail, they actually, it, it's actually suggested that more people died from missing one nutrient, which was vitamin C and getting scurvy, than all other causes combined. So, right, and, and during the age of sail, they were only out on their missions for maybe, you know, three months at a time. It wasn't nearly as long as what we're talking about. But vitamin C isn't maintained well in foods. They didn't necessarily bring the right foods. They didn't, um, they didn't understand nutrition, but even today where we do, it's not maintained that well in foods. So when you look at polar exploration, these missions were getting longer. So you think, okay, they had to know how to do it. Well, they did have cold storage on polar exploration missions, but uh, they also were hunting. And that was very important because they were getting their vitamin C from the animals they hunted. And yet, once again, a lot of people still died of malnutrition during polar exploration malnutrition or vitamin C deficiency. Vitamin C was a critical one because that one shows up a lot of times before a lot of other nutritional deficiencies. So when we look at the modern US military, they actually try and limit the use of the meals ready to eat to 21 days because they've done a lot of studies and they've determined that soldiers in the field start eating less of these foods and it actually will start causing them to lose weight and impact their performance and cognition. And if you want, a military that's high performing you have to feed them to be high performing so after 21 days they try to fly food in if they need to or they bring them back and set up um, real kitchens where they're feeding them hot meals and they do this to maintain the performance of the military so we are the only situation where we're trying to go out even on the international space station and feed people processed meals that are heat or rehydrate for this length of time and now it's only going to get longer so there are several issues with this prepackaged food system that we already know of. One of them is that the nutrients do degrade over time. Another is that the quality is already limited because you're working with a completely prepackaged food system. And now you're also getting the quality reductions over time just due to shelf life. Um, it's high mass and volume and you can't really customize a lot. So it's limited in variety. And so back to vitamin C, the nutrient degradation, this is one of our big challenges. So we do see that some of our nutrients, which includes vitamin C, degrade to concerning levels in our food. So this is just over three years. And these are our fruit products listed on the, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you can see milligrams of vitamin C per serving. And so the blue bar is the initial content of vitamin C. And a lot of these products are actually already fortified. The red bar is after a year of storage at room temperature. And then the brown bar is after three years of storage, and we need a five-year shelf life. So you can see some of these foods lose more than 75% of their vitamin C. So the question often comes up, why not use a vitamin supplement? Well, the nutrients degrade in a vitamin supplement as well. So that's already a problem. Number two, you can't get your calories from a vitamin supplement, and we need them to eat. And if the nutrition is degrading, the quality is probably also degrading. And so if they don't want to eat the food and they're not getting their calories, you know, nutrition is only part of that. Um, so we really want to maintain the nutrition in these foods. In addition, you have thousands of phytochemicals in fresh foods. We don't even know what they all are. We're starting to learn a lot more about what they do for our bodies, for our general health. Um, you can't replicate that with a pill. So the ultimate goal is to provide food the crew wants to eat, a variety of food they want to eat, where they're getting all their nutrition. Because how that's processed through your body and how it interacts with your microbiome and everything else, you cannot replicate with a pill. In addition to that, there's a psychological aspect that you can't replicate with the pills. So we want them to have high quality food that they're enjoying and that they can, they can uh, share meals just as we do here on Earth. They're very important. Like we just went outside and drank beer and, and had some very nice food. So we want to be able to provide that sort of um, camaraderie for our crew in flight. So I did mention the bioactive compounds. So one of our goals is to provide more functional foods that, and these functional foods would have health benefits beyond basic nutrition, and that can actually be a lot of just fruits and vegetables have health benefits beyond basic nutrition if you're eating them. 
So a lot of times when they say, oh, we're providing a functional food and it's like in a beverage that you get in the grocery store, they just took something out of a fruit or vegetable and they put it in that protein beverage for you. So we have a challenge here too. We've started measuring at a high level some of the uh, phytochemicals that, that we can measure. And we've measured anthocyanin stability recently in cherry blueberry cobbler. Um, so you can see the initial contents right there. And at a temperature of juice scenario, 35 degrees, um, we lose it pretty quickly. We still actually lose it pretty quickly if we just store it at room temperature. Refrigeration actually provides some of a benefit. So that's one of our goals is to see if that continues throughout shelf life and we can get to five years. So one of our other really big challenges is the acceptability of the food. Even if we provide the nutrition, even if it's stable, if we don't have the quality, if we don't have the variety and they don't want to eat it, we know they're not going to. So the history of space flight tells us that, the history of the military tells us that, and so we need to be able to provide it in that way um, because it does impact health and performance and it can impact cognition over time. Uh, so we, um, we, we looked at our thermostabilized foods. We have about 65 of them. And so we did a, a projection out to five years from some of our thermostabilized foods. And we determined that only about seven of them would still be acceptable in quality after five years. So this is a huge problem. They were actually all meat items. So this is one of um, the issues that we're still continuing to work on because we also know that food and the enjoyment of it becomes more important as these mission duration increases. So here's the contrasting challenge to the nutrition and the acceptability, the resource use. And so we are already challenged on the upcoming 21 day Orion missions to lower the mass of the food system by 10% because there's only limited mass that they can take on these missions. And so in order to do that, well, how would you do that? So um, actually, I'm gonna, I'll talk about that in a few slides, but if you project this out to a Mars scenario, for four crew members, we need about 10,000 kilograms of food for our just a Mars missions. You can see that's a lot of mass and they'd have to send ahead of the crew. Um, and anything that we do consider in any challenge, we have to consider the nutrition and acceptability too. So now I'm going to talk about some of the solutions that we are looking at. And we're looking at integrated solutions. So first of all, can we provide several different food systems together in a combination that will both increase variety and also provide some ability for the crew to customize or provide some ability for the crew um, to get different nutrients in different ways. So despite all the issues with prepackaged foods, there's still a, a good case for using it. Uh, it actually is safe. We know that prior to launch because we process everything on the ground. We test for pathogens, we test for microorganisms. So we provide a safe food system. So we're not worried about uh, the risk of foodborne illness in space flight. There's not a lot of infrastructure needed. It's, it's heat or rehydrate. So if the crew is busy, they can um, utilize the system pretty easily. And there's no risk of food scarcity. So you don't have to worry about anything growing. If it, it, it's there. And so you're always gonna have food to eat. Um, and we've also demonstrated that it can support crew health on six to 12 month missions on the International Space Station. So those are all very important cases to make for prepackaged foods. Now for all of the challenges for prepackaged foods, we have a variety of research going on. And this is actually, some of this is at different institutions. Uh, Natick Soldier Research Center is doing some research, the University of Massachusetts, and our lab at the Space Food Systems Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center is doing quite a bit of research in these areas. And these, uh, the research is, looking into the new, how to prolong nutritional stability, the acceptability, increase the variety, provide functional foods, and promote health. And we have to do this in a way that it's acceptable to the most people. So if somebody has a functional food that's really great, but it's only acceptable to 1% of the population, that won't really work for us because we need to appeal to 99% of the population with anything that we're going to put up there because we have such a limited amount of space and because we might not even know who the crew is before we send this food. So we're, we're looking at different formulations. Um, we're, we're, we are looking at fortification of some of the important nutrients into the foods directly. Um, and we're looking at increasing functional foods. In combination with that, we're looking at some matrices that actually have shown to stabilize the nutrition better. So some of the nutrients to 
seem more stable in some matrices. So if we start combining these things and look at them as a hurdle approach to losing nutrition, so if we combine the right formulations with the right process, and so right now we, we uh, uh, dehydrate the foods through freeze drying or we use some just dehydrated foods, and um, we, uh, we use the retort thermosterilization, which is basically a canning process, but we are looking also now at microwave-assisted thermal sterilization, which is a newer process that has recently been developed that heats the food to a really high temperature to a really short time. So it creates commercial sterility like the canning process, but in the canning process you heat the food up slowly to that really high temperature, and so you get more degradation of the quality of the product in order to get to that temperature where you need to get to to sterilize the food. So the outside of the food is getting cooked more because it just takes so long to heat to the inside where it's still cold. So um, using the right formulation and the right processing and then also finding the right packaging, which is one of our biggest challenges. The package that we use for the retort thermostabilized food has an aluminum layer in it. And that layer is an excellent moisture and oxygen barrier. And when we move to something like microwave assisted thermal sterilization, we can't use the um, the aluminum layer. So uh, the packaging that's out there right now, we depend uh, on the packaging industry to come up with solutions for something like packaging of foods. And the packaging that's out there that's compatible right now, it's not of the same barrier properties as what we have for the retort. So even if we can get an initial product that's excellent, it might not maintain for five years. So that's one of the things we are looking at. If we can get the state-of-the-art packaging for a system, um, and combine it with the right process and the right formulation. And then finally, the right environment. So if we do put these foods at cold storage, if we do have refrigerators and freezers, can we get to a five year shelf life? So that's the biggest goal is to find the right combinations, look at those combinations and see how we can achieve that shelf life that we need and also be able to provide the right variety of food and health promoting food within that. And so I did mention that we're looking at functional foods and we have done some product development over the past two years and we did develop quite a few um, different fruits, vegetables, and fish for space flight. So we're trying to increase those things um, based on the, the types of functional nutrients that are in them, especially omega-3 fatty acids, which has uh, been shown to be correlated with uh, bone density in space flight. So they, we want to increase uh, the opportunity for crew to consume fish and actually one of the fish that we're using, Viramundi, is farmed to be high in omega-3 fatty acids and it also has a lighter flavor. One of the issues you know, that some people have with fish and a lot of the packaged fish from the grocery store that we use, like salmon and tuna, is that they're very fishy. So if you want to get people who don't like fish to eat more fish, you have to find something not fishy that's high in omega-3s. So I did mention the resource reduction. How are we doing that? So this is a challenge because we still have to maintain the acceptability and the nutrition. Um, one of the immediate strategies that we're looking at is meal replacement. So if we provide a very dense meal replacement, like a bar um, that has a higher fat content. So fat is more dense than protein or carbohydrates. Uh, fat has nine calories per gram, whereas protein and carbohydrates have only four. Uh, our food system right now, we're a little bit lower on the fat side. And the reason for that is we're actually maxed out on saturated fat. We're at our limit. And so any additional fat we add has to be, has to be unsaturated. And unsaturated fat is the unstable fat. So it's the one that oxidizes and doesn't taste so good over time. So there's a challenge to increase the fat content um, in unsaturated fats. So more of the healthy fats and actually keep them stable and tasting good for a long time. So that's one of our... Um, Future strategies, we're hoping to be able to start doing that in some of our foods uh, without, so that we still have the variety, but we're increasing the density of our food system. Uh, and then one of the other strategies that we can use is uh, reducing the water content. The thing that we have to be careful about here is if you reduce it too low, you still have to add it back for them to drink. So for some things, you might be able to you know, reduce the water content a little bit and still have enough. We, we count the water in the food as part of their, uh, as part of their drinking water every day. So we have to be careful that we still maintain that balance. However, if we start going to um, a system where we're recycling all the water, we don't have to worry so much. So then you could provide more freeze-dried foods. However, we also have to remember acceptability. Crew don't want to eat all freeze-dried foods. So they would like some variety within that, which means that um, we, we can't just provide dehydrated foods even though they're recycling water. 
So there's there's definitely a balance within this um, that uh, that makes it kind of difficult to achieve a mass reduction and still provide them with those requirements. So bioregenerative foods are a possible solution for some of these things. Um, they provide a lot of benefits. So psychologically, they're very appealing. Um, they have a high nutrient density and they can provide fresh customization for the crew. They're great when you're also talking about colonization and moving toward self-reliance on these missions. Um, we actually have seen already with just, so some of you have seen the veggie that is in space right now and the Kennedy Space Flight Center is doing a lot of um, work with the veggie. Dr. Joya Massa um, has a lot of ongoing experiments with that and just the limited amount of produce that they've been able to grow uh, so far, they've really shown great enjoyment of it. And we know that just based on the number of pictures that they take with it. So the very few harvests they've had, just the proportional <coughs> amount of pictures is much bigger than a lot of the other things they take pictures of. So, um, you know, and they can use it in a variety of ways. They made a space burger with a tortilla because they don't have actual bread. They have tortillas because they don't have crumbs and they, we can make them shelf stable so they last for two years. So, um, you know, those, those are, that's very good evidence that there's a benefit here. And there are some studies right now with um, the Behavioral Health and Performance Laboratory and the Kennedy Space Center where they're looking at um, defining what that, that psychological appeal is and, you know, what benefit it's actually providing to the crew at quantifying that. Um, however, there are a lot of limitations for this system at this point. One of them is food scarcity. So if the food doesn't grow, you have nothing to eat and then you lose your crew. We do not want to be in that situation. Additionally, we start adding in a microbiological risk. So the crew goes up there with their microorganisms, they could get on the, on the plants, there, and then you have um, the issue of possibly having an a case of foodborne illness. So we still need uh, standards for how we're gonna do this, what are the limits for the microbiological requirements, and how we're gonna clean this produce in space white if they're eating it. So. Um, it's also high crew time requirements. So it takes uh, a lot more crew time to produce a very small amount of lettuce right now based on you know, the technology that we have than it does for them to open a package of food. And um, the infrastructure it, right now is a, lot, is a lot larger than they would need for their food, which is basically just rehydrate and heat. So it's at a low technology readiness level. And we do see um, that even at this low technology readiness level where they had crew tending these crops, um, there was, you know, if there's any watering issue, as there was in the case with these, these crops and veggie right here, um, you get some that don't grow. So this happened even with just six plants in space white. So our goal right now is to start integrating the system as a pick and eat system. So the crew are depending on their prepackaged food, but we start testing out these technologies and showing that they work and maturing them. And so they'll first start with just eating lettuce and just eating tomatoes. And then as the technology develops over time, and we can show that we're validating that this is going to work. And especially as we move towards colonization and away from just exploration, where there is more time. And they might have a surplus of food, so you're not as dependent on your crop, on on your crop growing and not losing it. We can start moving more towards this kind of system. So the... Third area I want to talk about is 3D printing of, of food. So uh, some of you might have seen this in the news actually a few years back. We, um, we funded a small business innovative research grant to a, the company SMRC, which was a very small business out in Austin. And they developed a 3D food printer. And the goal of their printer was actually aimed at personalized nutrition. So this was never going to be a whole food system. But the idea of it was we know we're losing nutrients in food. So if we, can stay, if we can provide some things in a stable powder form like vitamin C outside, you know, as a separate um, item, and we can use something like a printer that's very precise, and it can print very precise amounts of nutrients into the food, then we could provide both personalized nutrition and increasing quantities of certain nutrients we know we're losing over time. Because one of the other things is you can actually get nutrient toxicity. So you don't want to provide a lot at the beginning because you know you're going to lose it at the end. Um, you also don't want to provide a lot because a lot of nutrients don't taste good. So if you've ever had some nutritional beverages, you might know there's kind of an off flavor. So this was an I So when, when they built this printer, um, they wanted to show proof of concept. So they showed that they could print 
different consistencies of foods. So they printed a dough and a sauce and a cheese because those were very different consistency foods with the ultimate goal that this could be used for personalized nutrition, even in a home kitchen. So you could potentially, just like your Keurig, you could go out and buy canisters and prepare a personalized nutritional meal for yourself. Um, and you know, possibly the military is actually even looking at biometric um, uh, watches where they can get a feedback from soldiers in the field that would then feed to a 3D printer and they would print a customized meal that's personalized for that person to promote their performance based on what they've been doing in the field. So for all of these things, we come back to acceptability. Anything that we do, we have to show it is acceptable and that we have the nutrition that we need. So we do a lot of shelf life testing in our lab, both for uh, nutritional degradation and for sensory degradation. So we have people from around the Johnson Space Center, which can include the crew, which our end users come into our lab periodically, and we have different food sensory sessions. Um, and we also measure analytical changes within those foods, such as color changes and texture changes, and get an actual quantifiable measure. And then we can start to define where our user group is seeing a change that um, we have a quantified value for. So once we reach that value, we know they're going to notice the change and it's no longer going to be acceptable. Um, one of the things we've also been doing is just because you come in to our sensory session and you say you really like a food, it doesn't really necessarily translate to I'm definitely going to eat that entire food and I'm going to want it every week. So we're looking at, um, at testing our foods in analog emissions. We've started this recently and this is actually great because we started working with a lot of other labs at the Johnson Space Center um, in a very integrated way to see how our food system affects all these other systems and worked on targeted uh, nutritional countermeasures that um, can maybe help with some of these physio physiological issues. So uh, we especially use the human um, exploration and research analog, the HERA analog is at the Johnson Space Center, and we tested our food bars in there. Uh, we're working with the Behavioral Health and Performance Laboratory, and we're working with the Nutritional Biochemistry Laboratory and the Immune Laboratory, um, and we're also working with the J. Craig Venter uh, Center. They're doing some of our microbiome testing. So we're getting a really good idea of the food over time when people are consuming it, how, you know, how that uh, will do over time. Do crew start having um, impacts both psychologically because they start really not liking the food, they start eating less, how is this impacting their performance, and then um, how is it impacting their physiology. So we're getting all of that data from these, these ground studies. Um, we're hoping to take some of those to flight in the near future as well. So now I can just wrap it all up into the key points that I started with at the beginning. Um, the things that we really need to do with any space food system is to establish this, the safety, stabilize nutrition and acceptability, make sure there's variety to do that, and in contrast to those, reduce the resource use. So I really appreciate you all coming, and with that I will take questions. Can you do haggis? Can I do what? Scottish haggis. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a question? Yeah, I have a bunch. I'll just start off with one and I will come back to it again. I noticed, uh, I'm, I'm actually surprised, I, uh, I discovered that uh, this has a great deal of interest in me, far more than what I realized. Uh, the business about eating and food. Are you talking about the beverage? Yeah, well, I saw something up there. So it's probably artificial. What? It's probably artificial. A lot of the beverages, we get powder beverages from the grocery store and we pack them so that they can go to space flight and they can rehydrate them in microgravity. Okay. And I, I'm just going to jump to uh, something. So like Jules Byrne or something. 
Stephen King, Beckham, uh, <clears throat> drop shipping, drop shipping. It sounds ridiculous, but like when we have like prayer, we send ourselves packages, you know, and including food uh, and other things. And uh, you know, uh, two or three weeks later, you know, we stop out at a farmhouse or a, a grocery store or someplace and pick up our box that we shipped us so that we can get the new food. I know this sounds crazy. But I'm sure it's been thought of more. Is there some way at all that that you know a spaceship is traveling with the people on the end of the spaceship, but you can send another rocket? Uh, say, for example, long before the spaceship took off, so that this is not what he says to take us, but we so, can so rendezvous, rendezvous with with the space uh, the the uh, the food wagon. Well, that's actually kind of what we're doing because we're sending the food ahead of the crew on an unmanned vehicle. And it's going to actually take the food longer to get there than it does take the crew to get there. And then they will rendezvous. And that's why we need the five year shelf life. The, the, the issue is still the, the still mass up, and that's still the same problem. It's mm -hmm. the cost. Well, what I'm saying is a faster rocket. Oh, yeah, is that's going to be cost. Time <laughs> getting out there waiting because yeah. you don't have to worry about the gravitational problems and that sort of thing. Anyway. In space propulsion is a, another whole topic that's not under yeah. race's specialty and one of the big issues, if you can get there faster, some of these problems, not all of them, but some of these problems go away. Right now, they don't have that luxury. In space propulsion, solar electric propulsion and stuff is really slow. Nuclear is, is, is creating a bit of a buzz again, but there's some issues with that. So yeah, there's all these, I mean, this is one of the great things. I was actually, I knew the least about this topic most of the other space topics, I was fascinated about the, I mean, the level of detail. And as you see, just to get somebody to Mars, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily, you, everybody thinks of rockets and they think of habitats and they think of radiation. <laughs> this is like one of the most important things. So, so it's really, I mean, so just, you have to put all those different things together. And I think this is, this is crucial. So as far as telling them what to eat, so the whole menu is designed to be nutritionally adequate. And they do get some preference foods. So, and the nutritional biochemist actually gets the data. So uh, they fill out an app in Spaceflight, the ISS Fit, and they write down everything they eat. And he gets that data and he can see, um, you know, they, they're eating really well or they should be eating more foods in these areas and provides feedback that they do get and they get recommendations. So they do absolutely get recommendations. They are allowed to follow them or do what they want. So there's no prescribed diet in space flight and part of that is for the psychological reason. You know, food is one of the few familiar things they have and so we want them to find um, some pleasure in eating the food. Uh, as far as um, your second question, can you remind me just? Oh, just whether, you know, whether um, you have, whether the nutrition scientists have considered Sort of the older sort of tribe oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, that, that's another thing that comes back to uh, shelf stability because even when you're looking at salting foods, you know, they're only going to be stable for a certain amount of time in very specific conditions, and you still could have the risk of foodborne illness. Um, so the, the methods that we use, you know, they, they basically um, expend with a lot of those things and they can produce up to a three year shelf life. We do still <coughs> use salt though for things like processing aids. So it's not necessarily there, you know, to 
prevent microorganism growth because we remove the water for that reason. Um, but uh, it's there as a processing aid because some foods won't rehydrate unless they have enough salt or enough sugar in them, which is why you know we, we actually did go through a salt reduction several years ago because um, physiologically, you know, the crew had some symptoms that salt reduction would benefit. So we reduced the salt within our food system. But when you provide a fully processed food system, you still need a certain amount of salt for things like those processing, processing aids and for flavor. Um, so in general, uh, it's not used as a first line defense and it doesn't provide the shelf life that we need. That's actually one of the things that we're looking at. So the metabolism question, they're actually doing experiments right now on the International Space Station with crews that are up there for longer amounts of time to determine um, you know, the nutritional biochemistry if, if there's a change in that. As far as the plant growth, that's also ongoing. So uh, we, we do the tests in ground um, chambers. So you know, Dr. Joy Mass at the Kennedy Space Center does a lot of these. And she actually gets feedback from the International Space Station as far as the CO2 in the atmosphere, the temperature of the ISS, and she grows the plants in the, that same environment to determine on the ground, you know, what that might be like, but with gravity. But then to validate whether it's actually going to work the way you think, you still have to go into space because we can't really grow plants over time, you know, without gravity and with the, you, know, you need to change the watering system because you don't have gravity, so we can't only do that on the surface of wherever we're going to go. So if it's in microgravity, if we're on a Mars mission, you'd still have to validate it there. But you can get some feedback, you know, just from crew having gone there and, and having some of the living conditions and, and doing this in chambers. So you had a ground rule early on that said no cooking. So if you could cook, would that be good? I mean, if, if, I mean there's logistics problems and there's scaffolding and zero gravity, maybe not so much on Mars. But if you could, would that be good? Right, and so it would depend on the crew member. Some crew member might say, yeah, I really want to cook. And some would say, I'm really busy. I'm glad that um, all the food is prepackaged and I can just eat it really quickly. Uh, so it, it would really, and also if you start moving towards a colonization mission and away from an exploration mission, because the question really comes down to what kind of time does the crew have? Does the crew find that to be a useful way to spend their time? Um, you know, you do get customization. So uh, that's, a, that's a benefit that you could get from cooking. Um, but that would probably be more like a surface mission thing where we start having crops that are being grown and more of a, towards the direction of colonization rather than exploration where we're expecting them to be spending most of their time on the science and out exploring rather than um, doing things like spending hours cooking. A question about what the long term We, we have started some longer duration experiments, 45 days in the hair analog, where we are testing uh, the physiological impacts of basically prescribed diets. So if we do targeted nutritional plans, what does that look like physiologically? Well, behind, behind you, Millie, and then uh, I think you taught us that Matt Damon lived on the pages is not only a problem with the <laughs> So they ran out of food. Is there any group of natural foods or is anyone considering a synthetic food that would not satisfy any of the psychological characteristics but it could just be in a drum that would be a backup food source if your planned food source somehow failed in a long duration mission? Uh, so as far as a backup food source, that would just be the prepackaged foods. That's the best pack, backup food source that you can have. Well, I was thinking about right. 55 gallon drum full of goo. <laughs> <laughs> the primary food supply failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we're not looking at anything like that. 
Yes, so they do get condiments. And even though we went through um, reducing the sodium content quite extensively in our food system, uh, they do have sodium, so salt and water, and they have pepper and oil, um, and they can also provide, uh, they, they have a lot of hot sauce, so some crew members really like a lot of hot sauce, and they have a, a variety of other condiments. So they actually get um, one of those containers um, that, that I showed on an earlier slide, they get a whole one of those with just condiments uh, periodically, so they can definitely spice up their food. So before I, can I ask the question of the radiation? So you mentioned that a couple of times. What's, what's the, especially on the Mars mission, what's the, have you tested this and what are the kind of effects of radiation on either the food that you're growing or the prepackaged food or how does that work? Currently that's still an unknown and we're hoping to start working on some of that. So a few foods were tested after a long-term storage on the International Space Station, but um, the doses are still lower. And because it was only a few foods and a couple of them were, you know, it was mostly dry foods. So if you have a wet food, uh, you can have more um, reactions happening. So we're, we're hoping to get some more data on that, uh, even in the near future. Uh, so. Ultimately, though, you'd still have to validate it in deep space because even if you use the beam at Brookhaven, you're only going to get a segment of what's going on. So it's likely to be a lower risk um, just based on the fact that we've had food on the International Space Station and there is a higher radiation effect. But it's still an unknown because when you go out to deep space, you are getting different types of radiation at a higher level. We don't provide alcohol to the crew. Don't we don't. Yeah, we don't. And so, to the Russians, right? so um, I would say about the the other question, which is, do we do we uh, test crew out with different foods ahead of time? Um, generally, crew just need to be able to eat many different things uh, because the it is a standard menu, and if you eat more of one type of food, you're limiting that food for your crew members, and you can also create nutritional issues if you're limiting yourself to one segment and then your crew is left with the other segment. So um, in general, they just need to be good at eating varied amounts of different foods and, and not really have restrictions. Um, so they get a chance to taste all the foods before they go up into flight and because we have about 200 different ones. We get very limited time with them. They come into our lab, usually as a crew, and they try maybe 40 different foods at once. So they'll have basically a spoonful of each. Um, they're very busy. So, you know, every group only gets limited time with them. So they get, basically, it's more like a food familiarization time with us rather than, you know, I'm really tasting these foods and I know which ones I really like and which ones I don't. They get an idea of that. Uh, so, th but they do get a chance to taste all the foods on the menu before they go into space flight. Sir, so, uh, does anyone track what the crew members eat and yes. say, by the way, you're behind Yes, the nutritional biochemist. So they fill out an app in they space. Themselves? Yes, they they record that. But then someone's looking over. And yes, the nutritional biochemist. So so we had a, a presentation by Pablo Nespolia a few weeks ago. There's some documentary that was made with him, and one of the comments he made was, food was a big deal, mm -hmm. and it was kind of getting bored. But they actually had this thing where they would say, hey, so he's Italian, so we're going to do an Italian meal tonight, and. So how do the cultural, when you've got this diverse crew from different, especially with the space station, how much do you give, I mean, I know they've got the preferred pre preference foods, but how much does the kind of, does, it, does that just feed into the whole cultural aspect about, you know, you know what my mum what my used to make? And which, I'm going to ask you about haggis again, but, but you know, <laughs> but, you know, but, you know yeah. how does that play into, into, into what you're trying to do? So we provide the food for the 
U.S. operating segment crew members. So that's the U.S. crew, the Canadian crew, the European Space Agency crew, um, and the JAXA crew, so the Japanese Space Agency crew. The Russians provide the food for the Russian side, and they can share food if they choose to. Um, and so the preference is the only real place where there's an international opportunity. And so the international agencies often will provide food uh, for the preference menus for their crew when their crew is flying. And a lot of times those crews might bring a few things to share, so then there is like the Italian night or something like that. Yes? Well, last question. You're looking backwards. You, you uh, have a question? I don't want to follow up any question. Uh, well, you ask your question, and the last okay, question will be clear. Uh, are you allowed to jettison litter in space? The resupply vehicles that come up when they unload them, they can put the trash on those, and most of those vehicles burn up coming back into the atmosphere. So the SpaceX is the vehicle that actually returns, and they usually put science on that one, so they can return science so to the ground. Do they have a trash compactor? They do have compactors for some of their trash, like ways to crush cans. So the Russians still use cans, and then um, some of the international partners still use cans when they send food. So they have ways to like uh, compact those cans. I heard you say sharing, but, but you were talking about the Russians sharing an unopened package with somebody else, that sort of thing. But what about the Russians? You sure don't want to waste any food. The guy can't eat the rest of his chocolate cake. Usually, you would want somebody else to eat that, right? Well, I would expect that that's up to the crew. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but I mean, you're talking about weight. Right, and, uh, right. Logistics. So there is food waste in space flight, and part of that is, um, here on Earth, you know, we get a lot of choice. They don't get as much choice as we do. And so they're eating out of a standard menu. And if the whole crew does not want to eat a food, then they don't eat that food. And you can't really get away from that because we have crews rotating up there and the next crew might love that food. And if that food's still up there, they might actually eat it if it's still there, but sometimes they get thrown away ahead of time. So you can't really get away from having food waste and have your crew be happy. You can't tell them you have to finish this and you have to eat all the foods in the standard menu and have them be happy because food is too critical psychologically, you know, just uh, as far as being able to have some choice and being able to eat the food you enjoy. All right, Kaylee, finish us off. That's a very good question and one that um, we haven't, so we haven't gotten to that point where we've had to worry about that at, at this point. So, you know, um, that, would, that would be something that might be considered if you go on a really long duration space flight. And, you know, to this point, I can't tell you a good answer to that one. Okay, well, I, 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 I learned that an awful lot today. That was really fantastic. So please join me in thanking Grace. And, uh, <laughs>